Jesus Christ for Chicken Little. Um, I mean, this is just a quick way of saying, who are you following? I mean, is the sky falling or are we going to act with some civility and some coolness under pressure? You know, and a lot of that comes from really having a better understanding of your history. What's, what's happened before us? Because frankly, there is nothing new under the sun. The challenge is, though, getting an understanding of things that are beyond our time frame. Uh, you know, right now we're mired in the, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways in the, the shutdown of much of our regular uh, movements based on the threat of a virus, the, the, this COVID-19. And I mean, if we're familiar with history, we've seen in a number of different extents how viruses or sicknesses have affected societies. In some situations, it's wiped out large portions of our population. In other instances, it's been something that's threatened to be large and, not, in effect, not really meant to be. I mean, we've lived in recent years through the swine flu, the chicken flu, the bird flu, the pig flu. Um, we've had AIDS, we've had SARS, and so forth. And not trying to compare this to any of the above, but fact of the matter is this. Do we act like Chicken Little or do we act like Jesus Christ? Now, I'm not going to talk with you about, you know, how we should handle and deal with this today, honestly, because I think we're still learning too much about this to understand the full scope and spectrum of how this is going to affect us in, 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 the, uh, in the near future. But fact of the matter is this. Christ gave us a, a roadmap for how we should handle all things. How we should handle all things. And I think, again, by knowing our history, it helps us to not fear what's ahead. But what I do want to address more specifically is, which is as proximal, because we're in the midst of it now, is the political season. You know, this year we, we vote for another president. And if we, we actually do a quick survey of our American governance, there's quite a bit there that gives us the fodder to laugh at, but gives us something to, to go, okay, we've been here before, we can get through this. In 240 years, 240 plus years, this country has stood, stood strong. It's, it's, it's outlasted some of the craziness that's happened. During the election of 1800, President John Adams and his opponent, Thomas Jefferson, were at it. And one newspaper published that under President Jefferson, if, if President Jefferson was elected, we would have murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest, as, which they will all be openly taught and practiced. Not just that they were going to happen, but they were going to be taught. They were going to become part of what we were going to advocate in our, our, in our society if Jefferson was to become president. <laughs> I mean, as crazy as that sounds, right? Now, I, and, and, and on top of that, that the air would rent with cries of dis distress and the soil would be soaked with blood. In other words, you know, people would be dying in the middle of the streets and the nation would be black with crimes, right? Now, another, another Adam supporter claimed that if Jefferson were elected, he would, we would see our wives and daughters as victims of legal prostitution. Well, Jefferson was elected, wahoo wah, and that didn't happen. Now, Subsequently, when Aaron Burr was tied with Thomas Jefferson, uh, tied against Thomas Jefferson for the office of president, Alexander Hamilton convinced Congress to put Jefferson in office, leaving Burr the vice president. Okay, government was handled a little differently then. Not, you want to learn more about that? If you got plenty of time right now, you know, Google it. But Burr was instilled, and in, he was put in the office of presidency. But and while the VP, while Burr was the VP. He challenged Hamilton to a duel, not with his fists, but with guns. Okay, he was he was a, he was a gangster in office. They were gangsters. Byrd challenged Hamilton to a duel in 1804 and shot him, and then was subsequently slain with a charge of murder because he killed Hamilton. Cheney is not the first VP to shoot someone while in office. Craziness in politics is not a new thing, but how should we handle it? Like Chicken George, Chicken George, mm. like Chicken Little. Or Jesus Christ. Like Chicken Little or Jesus Christ. Now, how did Jesus deal with political lunacy? In the midst of governmental oppression, he was as cool and collected as a man can be. Let's think about this. If you're familiar with the week of his passions, okay, Jesus rode into Jerusalem the week before he was crucified. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, you know, the, the lowest of the, uh, I guess, cargo hauling horse-like animals, okay? This was juxtaposed to the to Pontius Pilate, who 
on the other side of town rode in with chariots and noble steeds with to a parade. Jesus rode into town on a noble donkey, on a, on a lowly donkey, but yet he was hailed on Palm Sunday as he came into town. The people of the people, the common people, celebrated him. Hosanna, Hosanna, hail Jesus, hail the King of Kings, this so forth and so forth, thinking that he was coming to give them military victory over the Romans. But Christ had before this healed the sick, preached the good news, brought many to salvation and given hope to those who were hopeless. Over the course of the next couple of days, he ransacked the temple, which was the headquarters for the Jewish governance. It's where they collected taxes to pay the Roman government. It's where they collected funds to take care of the temple and to line their own pockets so they could live the lifestyles of the rich and famous. He preached the gospel that gave people independence from the temple, letting them know that they need not pay these, 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 this Jewish hierarchy, this Hebrew hierarchy for salvation. The salvation came through their relationship with Christ. It came with relationship with God. So he basically came in and told them he, 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 he was critical of the government. He was critical of the government. He turned over tables in the temple. He confronted them man to man and had civil discourse. Mark chapter 13, Mark chapter 14 speaks specifically and outline the incidences over the course of that week. So this all sets up the backdrop to on Holy Thursday, the Thursday before his crucifixion, the Thursday before Good Friday, the day of his crucifixion, he's absconded in the middle of the night. He's taken in the middle of the night by the, the, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the, the rulers, so to say, of the Hebrew government during that time in Jerusalem. He's taken out of the Garden of Gethsemane after being betrayed by Judas. He's, he's, he's taken in the middle of the night handcuffed and escorted to a kangaroo court. I guess is a good way to describe it, where you had false testimony from people looking to get him executed for all sorts of high crimes and misdemeanors, basically trying to up, uh, I guess as they claimed, um, for blasphemy, for take, trying to take overthrow the government. He's escorted from one lower court to another where he's put in front of the governor, the Roman governor of the area. And Rome was big on keeping order. Rome was big on keeping order and collecting their taxes. So in the midst of all of this, Jesus is being interrogated. He's being abused. He's being besmirched wrongfully. He's being called names. They're yelling things out about him that are not true. And this is all to set up this scene. Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect, the Roman governor at that day, says to Jesus as he stands for him, and asks him, Matthew 27, 11, he asks him, are you the king of the Jews? Simple question. Now, I'm thinking, without knowing the story, if someone asks me if I'm the man and I'm the man, yeah, I'm the man. I might go Incredible Hulk on him, you know, let him know I am the man. But Jesus simply says, it is as you say. It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. He answered Pilate, it is you say, and all these other parties that had everything else to say, Christ stood in silence. Jesus was wrongfully arrested in the middle of the night, then immediately subject to a circus trial. Then after that, Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But Jesus said not a word. So the governor, Pontius Pilate, was taken aback by this and marveled greatly. Marveled greatly. And was initially inclined to just let Jesus go. Sometimes you win by simply staying quiet. Not all questions merit a response. Jesus' example here bodes well for the notion, walk the walk instead of talking. Not every attack requires a response. We should be cool in the midst of a perceived storm, 
if you know your history. Now, I don't want to mistake that for your someone says something to you that merits a response, you know, or that silence of mm, I'm just not answering because I have an attitude, or that silence of I'm going to show you, but a silence of you know the answer. Need I actually tell you? Or you've been unreasonably provoked, or you've been provoked, someone's trying to provoke you. You need not say anything sometimes and simply let the attack occur because once it's passed, it has no effect on you. In these moments, Christ was cool, as he was in the midst of natural disasters. Think about when he was out on the lake with his disciples and the storm came and the boat started to rock. Christ was asleep with his head on a cushion, head on a pillow in the midst of a, of a storm. Let's call it a tornado on the lake. As his disciples were frantic, as they were frenzied, thinking the sky is falling, what did Christ do? He woke, said, be still. He, one, he demonstrated cool in the midst of a storm, but he also demonstrated that he, he is powerful. He can make the storm go away. He can settle the confusion. So the question is posed again. Are you going to be like Chicken Little or Jesus Christ? Do we even know who Chicken Little is? Let me let me let me rewind, I guess, and you should know who Chicken Little is if you don't. Chicken Little or Henny Penny is synonymous with the skies falling. He's that cartoon character, the chicken, right? And I guess the proper animal, the chicken, who's always running around the skies falling, the skies falling. That story is over 25 centuries old. And it's become equivalent to noting that or, or thinking that the hysteria is, uh, the, the world is hysterical. The mistaken belief that disaster is imminent. And it was a mistaken belief because despite the fact that, that Chicken Little thought that the sky was falling, it never actually fell. Uh, you know, things were going crazy around him, but the sky never actually fell. History. Andrew Jackson. <laughs> President. Andrew Jackson walked around hitting people with a cane. He had at least 13 duels while he was the president. <laughs> that just makes me think if our current president could walk around hitting with people with a cane, how many people he would have hit? <laughs> how many duels he would have had? John Quincy Adams swam across the Potomac. He was a nudist. The president was a nudist. He swam across the Potomac in a nude almost daily. There has been insanity in our politics since day one. But in 240 years, the sky is not falling. So this is what I challenge you, brothers and sisters. Rather than simply engage the political process, we have a duty to elevate it. We have a duty to elevate it. Like any other sin, like any other thing that's wrong, we are called to stand above the partisan dissension and demonstrate a better way. Should we have an opinion? Absolutely. Should we care about our country? Yes. Should we vote? Goes without saying, absolutely, beyond a doubt. People forget that when Jesus was born, what were his parents doing? They were going back home so they could participate in the census. They had a civic duty to be counted, to be held accountable. In order to be held, held accountable, you have to let your voice be heard. Now, we, there are a lot of ways to do that, but the basic way of uh, let your voice be heard is through the vote. And yes, we can get into discussions about votes counting and voter tampering and corruption and all of that, but speak when given the mic. Our mic is the vote. Now, this is a paradox. Our way of thinking is that one with strengths of the faith, Jesus taught was in its, its, its meekness, okay? So strength and meekness, you generally think of those as separate, but Jesus spoke of strength being based in meekness. The faith he taught vaunted free will over compulsion. Love requires free will. We're supposed to love God, love our neighbor. So we've got to recognize that if you love, you cannot force someone to follow, whether it's regarding religion, personal perspectives, or politics, okay? Love requires free will. You cannot force anyone to do anything. And the second we start to realize that you cannot make me believe, you cannot make you do something, it should ease the tension. Yeah, we, we, it's okay, and it's actually great to have barbershop, to have those discussions. But it should be with the proper content and the proper context. I heard it said that if 
you're using the government to compel people to practice your spiritual beliefs, you might be the reason that baby Jesus is crying. Now, yeah, this isn't overstated because there is no baby Jesus crying anywhere, but it goes to the point that Christ did not come so that we could force people to believe. He came so that we could have faith, we could have hope, so that we could have love, and that we are now to go out and spread the good news, and that by spreading the good news, that should cover and take care of the interpersonal issues that we have. But if we're jumping on a soapbox and beating people over the head with with our, our, our message of which our thoughts may be on how things should be. We're not walking in the path, walking in the way that he had, he charged us to walk. Both political parties have God-fearing church-going members who claim Christ. There is a Christian left, there is a secular right. You should engage in politics, but we must not be defined by our arbitrary policies by our arbitrary political lines. Political talks, radio and cable news, which have defined and further partitioned our society, they only want ratings, you know, generally speaking. I mean, I'm sure they're good people. I hate the way this is gonna come out, but there are good journalists. You know, there are some good people in the media. But generally speaking, cable news is all about ratings. Media personalities are not on a moral crusade. They get rich by instilling fear and paranoia in their listeners. If we give our favorite political pundits, our favorite political ideologues more time than we give Christ, we are following the wrong masters. We're following the wrong masters. Those who argue over politics don't love their country more than others. They just love to argue more than others. Strife and quarreling are symptoms of weak faith. Proverbs 10.2, 2 Timothy 2, 23-25, and James chapter 4, verse 1. These are among a number of chapters and verses that speak to that notion that strife and quarreling are symptoms of those who are weak in faith. And they are among the things that the Lord detests. We need to rise above the vitriol and learn to love our neighbors the way God commanded us. We need to love our atheist neighbor who wants to keep creationism out of schools. We need to, and I'm gonna use labels and titles here for lack of a better way of, of expressing it, but we need to love our democratic neighbor who wants to keep gay marriage and abortion legal. We need to love our Republican neighbor who celebrates death penalty and gun ownership, and yes, even the presidential candidate from the other side. Thinking our political platform is unflawed is a mistake. The social policies of your party were constructed by imperfect politicians, fueled by ambition. It's nearsighted. It's nearsighted to canonize them, and it will make you obsolete in four years. In four years, in a few years. Every four years, the parties adopt a platform of their respect at their respective conventions, and while they stay on their general tracks. Every four years, those platforms change. Unlike God, who's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Just think. <laughs> the Tea Party. Where are they? That was the next coming. That was the next political movement. Where's the Tea Party? Scripture tells us to pray. To pray for our governing leaders. 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. And to respect those in authority. Translation. If you're mocking your governance via Facebook, Twitter, or in person, the Holy Spirit is grieved. We should spend more time honoring and less time vilifying our, our governance. Now, this does not mean that we do not pull them on the carpet for saying and doing wrong. But it does mean we should spend less time speaking badly of. This doesn't mean praying that the president should be in, or praying that the president will be impeached, God commands us to pray for our leaders, for their wisdom, for their hearts, for them to be led by him. Again, it doesn't mean that we can't critique them, but we should do so with respect. We can be just as Jesus was critical of our governments, but we should do so respectfully. And again, by praying for their hearts, by praying for their minds that they're led by him, 
truly think if, uh, uh, if our government leaders are led by God, faithfulness, mercy, justice, law, the faithfulness, mercy, and justice, which he told us that we're supposed to follow, should be followed, and all will be made better. Hmm. How about this one? This is the most important election in our history of our nation. I don't care to hear that statement ever again. Because it's not. This is not the most important election in our nation's history. The most important election in our nation's history was when Abraham Lincoln was elected president. Before that, we thought it was okay to own people. Every generation thinks that it's living in the most important moment in history, but we're not. Our parents were not. Our children probably won't be. And that's okay. It's still important to be involved. It does not diminish or eliminate the need to participate properly. We are defined not by who we vote for, but who we follow. There's a difference. We are defined not by who we vote for, but who we follow. As Christians, our identity and self-worth are rooted in who God says we are. He says we are forgiven, chosen, loved, adopted, welcomed, justified, redeemed, amongst another, a number of other great qualities and adjectives. Remember this. Another person's bad behavior is not an excuse to act up. Because we are those former we are those former adjectives. During this time of the year, where we are geared up to celebrate Passover as we are entering the Easter season, the resurrection, let's give him honor by spreading love, the spreading the love that he left us one to another. Take this quote with you, this Matthew twenty three twenty three. The major thing Christ warned of is hypocrisy and political division and political activism. He said, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your cumin, your spices, your mint, and your dill. In other words, you give of your money. You may give of your time and your resources to the body of Christ. You are giving. Great. And I don't say that sarcastically. But you've neglected the more important matters of the law. You've neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. In other words, yes, give of your time, your money, your resources. But do not neglect being merciful. Do not neglect seeking justice do not neglect being faithful to Christ. Even if we have political differences, recognize that the sky is not falling. Be like Jesus Christ, not like Chicken Little.